Our lifestyle by itself should be another form of evangelism. As it stands right now, the church is in a confused state because of lack of understanding of redemption, the redemptive power, and the benefits of redemption. We have taken Christianity as another form of a societal meeting. We just come and meet. I want to put it to you. You cannot jump into the swimming pool and come out dry. It's not possible. But many are jumping into the swimming pool and they're coming out the same way they were. Now, there is this chemical, Morandini will remember, it was being advertised. That chemical, once you spray that chemical on your clothes, no dirt will attach itself to your clothes. No wetness. Your clothes will never be wet. Nothing will happen. So, deception operates like that chemical. That you will be in the church, but nothing is changing. Hallelujah. Can we opt to be a different church? Hallelujah. The reason why... Okay, I don't, want, I don't want to say this because I'm alive, but I'll say it when I'm no longer alive. Many prefer to be told what is happening in their lives by someone than for them to know for themselves. That's the reason why the churches where people are told there are a lot of people. But where the people where people are supposed to be taught how to know what is happening in their lives, there are not a lot of people. Why? That because of the misalignment in understanding redemption. Hallelujah. So I'm, I've broken it into pieces and I'm believing God that you will follow me. Pay attention and go back and listen to the message again. Because I believe that if every child of God can understand this, our lives will never be the same again. Hallelujah. Peace number one was the will of man versus the will of God. We, we, we've spoken in detail about this. I'm not going to go deeper into it. We say prior, prior to the fall of man, man only understood one will. That is the will of God. Man only understood that he, he or she is supposed to do what God commands them to do. In other words, men did not know any other voice except the voice of God. That is very much important. You understand this, you master this, you, you, you will live a prosperous, a healthier life, and what? Whatever life that, that you want to live. The most important thing, men, the first men, did not know any other voice except the voice of God. It's very much important. And that makes the first man to always be subjected under the will of God. Because you are always subjected under the will of the voice that you give hearing to. Are we together? Whatever that you give, that's the reason why the world is investing trillions and trillions into media and marketing. Why? The main purpose of Satan is to influence the way we think and the way we see things. Once that is influenced, our will is automatically influenced. Are we together? So many of us believe things that we don't even know where they come from. We have a lot of beliefs. Instead of one belief, a today's Christian has the belief in God and has their belief in their own abilities and they believe in their own failures and they believe in their generational failures and they believe in their family failures. They believe in that. So there are a lot of beliefs instead of one central belief, which is God in Christ Jesus. And that has made us to have what I call fragmented wills. Fragmented with that, our will is broken into pieces. You believe this? Uh, your will be done, sickness upon my body as it is in Satan's will. Uh, by his stripes I'm healed. 
uh, Satan, uh, your poverty may rule over my life as it is in a will. But God has given me all things. I'm a failure, you know, just like my father has been failing, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. So, do, do, do you understand what is happening in today's church? And after that, we stand up and say, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. As we walk out, something happened. Yeah, was it Corona retired this year? You just declare that Corona is the Lord of your life. So, this misunderstanding of the will of God versus the will of man has put the church that we, we are progressively pro, in progression of making the next generation to be like us. Okay, I'm going to tell one parent. Just ask one parent. When was the last time your child asked you for something and you said, go pray and see if God can, can provide for us? We don't do that anymore. Do you know why? It's only Abraham who did that with Isaac. When Abraham was about to uh, kill Isaac, Isaac asked him, he said, Father, the fire I see, the wood I see, the altar I see, but where is the sacrificial lamb? And Abraham said, no, the Lord shall provide and from that today onwards, from that day to, till today, we still have the word called Jehovah Jireh. The Lord shall provide. It came out of the first man showing the son that, you know what? I'm working in the will of God. I don't know what I'm going to do next, but what I know that the Lord will provide. So this is the language that's supposed to be adopted in our families, in the church. In everything that we do, we're supposed to be putting God first. Am I talking to someone? We're supposed to be teaching our children to put God first. So that's why the will of God has lost its hold in our lives. Why? Because our will has taken a center stage. The moment your will takes a center stage in your life. Just know that your will is under the will of Satan. That we have to know. The moment we fail to listen to the word of God, to the voice of God, and do what the word of God says, because it's one thing to listen and one thing to do. What is the will? I'm going to talk about the will that is left by people who have died. Even no, no judge, no policeman will change what is in the will unless or otherwise it's found that that will does not meet the condition of the law. They will do that will to the T. I leave my car to this one. The spare will of this car will give to this one. I will leave my house, the, the chair in the house, I'll give this one. And people, will, 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 they will distribute evenly like that. Why am I spending time in the will of God? Without understanding the will of God, we won't be able to follow the word of God. Am I talking to someone this morning? Look at you. Say, neighbor, you are the product of the will of God. Through his word. Do you understand that? And God said, God willed it in heaven. Then God willed it in heaven. He willed it. He said, let us make man. That's his will. As he willed it, he's releasing the word. Let us make man according to our image. He's willing it and he's releasing what? The word. So, you cannot separate the word and the will of God. Do you want to see your life changing? Align your will with the word of God and release his word. We believe, therefore, we speak. Am I talking to someone? Number two, the cracks of deception. 
The serpent didn't go to tell the woman that eating the fruit will alienate him from God. That's Genesis 3. Deception comes in forms of half truth. It's half, it's half truth and half a lie. So, even the church today is still living in half truth, half a lie. My son, I've got this sticker. You put this sticker in your car, my son. No more accidents. Rubbish. The, the sticker has the word of God in it. Have the truth. The lie, the sticker doesn't prevent accidents. Deception. So, instead of you believing in the word that is there, you believe in the face of a man next to the word and the sticker. Mm, I will say it. And that's deception. So, that's how deception came. When deception came, it, Satan did not lie. He said, you will know what? If you eat this fruit, you will know what? Evil and good. He was right. But he didn't tell them that evil will be on their side. And they will be separated from good. Am I talking to someone? That is the crux of deception. So he didn't tell them that evil will be on your side. You will be on the evil side. You will be permanently separated from good. Because good belongs to God. He said God is afraid that if you eat this fruit, you will know evil and good. That deception. Many people are operating half truth. No, don't worry. Uh, let's come. Let's stay together. You know, the grace of God is sufficient. Yes, the grace of God is sufficient to those who are ignorant to his word, to those who don't know his word. But those who are doing it intentionally, that is no longer the grace, that's rebellion. Deception. Am I talking to someone this morning? So, there is a difference between you not knowing what you are doing and intentionally rebelling. So, that is why the enemy has caught many. No, don't do this. No, don't, 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 don't do it. It's fine. You see, you are still alive. You see, you are still alive. You see? If you see you ate the fruit, you are still alive. Did you die? Permanently, Eve was blinded from the spiritual life because she was spiritually dead. You know, I was watching a video last night, a song. Take shows. I'm, 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 I'm falling in love with the man. Meeting our man. So, I was looking at the way they were dressed. And Holy Spirit says something interesting. He said, are you aware that those people are worshipping me in my glory? But the first glory didn't require them to wear anything. The first glory, in the first glory, they wouldn't have looked at what, the way they look or not. They wouldn't have looked at the colors that they are wearing. The first glory will have given them what God is wearing with what, with what we'll be wearing today. He said, he began to minister to me on the concept of sin. You see, the sin has made men to be creative in order to cover their sinfulness. The suit is nice because of the creativity of the man. But if you understand the origin of the suit, you realize that the suit is nice. The glory was better. Am I talking to someone? Hallelujah. Say I'm enveloped by the glory of the Lord. Say deception won't remove me from the glory of the Lord. Because that was the purpose of deception. And what happens outside the glory of the Lord? Death. Number, I mean, I mean number what? Two. Three. The two school of thoughts. We're going somewhere with this. 
There is a, one school of thought that says we can continue living in sin because the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for us. Therefore, as long as you believe, God won't look at you. He will be looking at the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, his grace is sufficient. There are people who believe that. And there's another cool of thought that says, the blood of Jesus Christ has redeemed you from sin. Be holy because God is holy. Who calls you is holy. So, the other school of thought is the deceptive one. It's, they are right. The grace is there. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the, the purpose of grace is not for us to willingly sin. Grace is not the license to sin. Instead, grace gives you the ability to what? To resist sin. Grace like vitamin pills. Grace, when you eat vitamin pills, you don't want to be a healthy, sick person. Do you hear what I said? You are not taking vitamin pills to be a what? A healthy, sick person. Because that, if that other definition of grace is saying, we're gonna be, we can be sinful Christians. The moment we mention sin, we are separated from God. Because God and sin do not be. So, the moment we mention sin, so Christianity is no longer there. So, that is, that is the other school of thoughts. But I believe in the one who said, be holy, for I am holy. Live a holy life, for I am holy. I believe in that school of thought. Why? Because when the grace comes to you, the grace comes to give you the ability to move away from sin. You are able to resist that which you couldn't resist before. That's the purpose of grace. Hallelujah. Does it matter what God has said? I told you that today we're going to be like, I want you to take notes. Because once you understand this, your Christianity will be in a different level. Does it matter what God has said? It matters. If you go to Deuteronomy 28 verse 1, he said, if you diligently hearken unto what God has said. So the main word there is diligent. What is to diligently listen? Diligent, you must understand what is to be diligent. Doing the same thing at the same time perfectly. Perfecting your skill. You are diligent. So if you are diligently listening unto the word of God, mean that there is no day that you say, today I don't listen to God. Today I will listen to God. No. Those who diligently listen unto God, listen unto God diligently, meaning every day, every time we are listening to God. Can you go to Deuteronomy 28 verse 1? I said, if you diligently, can you read it to yourself? What does it say? Deuteronomy 28 verse 1. What does it say? If you diligently obey. So, I just, I just want to disqualify the, the previous school of thought that say you can live in sin. If we diligently obey, meaning what God says is who God is. So when we obey his word, we are living in his word. When we live in his word, we are living in holiness. Then what do we do when we make a mistake and do things? If we confess your sins, if you confess and repent, he's quick and just. To forgive you and cleanse you from all forms of unrighteousness. But the key word is obey his word. So th those are, I'm, I'm telling you now about now the technicalities of redemption. Who are you? Does, is, what, is what God saying matters? Yes, it matters. God did not change what he said in Egypt when we were telling Pharaoh. He's the same God who said to Jesus Christ, it's fine. You can, take, you, you, you can surrender your spirit and die. 
The same God who spoke to Pharaoh, the same through Moses, is the same God who spoke to, to Paul. So he doesn't change. He is consistent. So let us not be brainwashed by today's media that is trying to neutralize the effectiveness of what God has said in our lives. Because once that is neutralized, the benefits of the words of God get eroded from you. Am I talking to someone? The benefits of the word of God get eroded once the word of God is neutralized. Once we undermine the word of God, even that which is supposed to come to us gets undermined. Am I talking to someone? You should be in a place where you are able to pray and say, Father, it is done. When I went, when I went home, I met, I met one businessman. He said to me, hey, Pastor, he loves me a lot. He said to me, Pastor, uh, it's not going well with my business. I said, no. Before the end of April, it, you're going to get the job. It's done. I did not speak to him as me. I said, Jesus Christ, that's why how he is to operate. Go, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Go your way. Your son lives. What did he use? Words. I, I want you to see the importance of words. Go your way, your son live. Lazarus come forth. What was used? Words. So what God says matters. Uh, no, I want you to put it to what God says matters. Don't ever be in the habit of undermining what God has said. Especially concerning you. What God says matters. You need to be in the habit of saying I can see all the negatives that are happening around me. I choose to believe. I choose to believe in the word of God. Whatever that the enemy is trying to make me believe, I don't believe it. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am the redeemed of the Lord. By his stripes I have been healed more than 2,000 years ago. My God has supplied all my needs according to his riches in glory in Jesus Christ. I am blessed coming in and blessed going out. They can curse me, but their curse won't speak to me. Like Balaam, their curses were, became blessing. You know, choose to believe what God has said. Why? Because you know that what God says matters. But until the word of God becomes important in your life, it won't be effective in your life. Am I talking to someone? The purpose of redemption. And one thing, we have become religious. The spirit of familiarity. We are too familiar with the word of God. What did I say? Do not sin. You know, it's a vendor of proverb that says we've been eating the lion's children. Nothing has happened to us. <laughs> and I don't know how vendor people came up with that. <laughs> I mean, how do you eat the lion's children? But anyway, it's a topic for another day. <laughs> so, Satan wants you to focus on your physical being and not make you understand the effects of our rebellion towards the word of God. Because they are spiritual. I was reading a scripture. I can't remember where it is. He said, our fathers, the, the, the woman said, our fathers who did this have gave us this land. And the Holy said to me, can you see the importance of the obedience of the fathers? You, you know, we as parents, the next generation will, will hold us accountable. Dad, did you know that this is what the word of God says? Okay, what have you done about it? Ah, my son, you see, I want to, you know, you know, our ancestors said, no, I hear you, but the word of God, Daddy, what did, you know, you know, I'm a pansy, but no, no, Daddy, but you believe in the word of God. You know, we, we, we will account. 
Why? Redemption is generational. There are two identities of a redemption. One is Adam, the other two, and the other one is why is Jesus Christ. And we are both Adams. I want you to look at the importance of the word. Because if you don't understand this, this Bible will be like another storybook. When Adam sinned, you, you, you were not born. You were not born, Mr. Trusi. We were not there. But we are still feeling the effects of that. Am I right? But when Jesus died on the cross also, we were not there. But we are still seeing the effects of the cross. So, which one are you choosing to feel more? Which one? Those are the two identities. Which one are you choosing? Because they, they both have humanity inside. Adam was a man. And Jesus is the last Adam. The importance of the word of God. Once you choose the word of God, you are identifying with the last Adam. Jesus, the son of God. Are we together? Hallelujah. You look so serious. Hmm? <laughs> I love, it. I love it when you are serious. Speaking about the two identities, we're going to come to the crux. Today will take a little bit longer because I don't want to cut this message off. I want, I want to download it all to you so that you can have something to digest at home. Hallelujah. Talking about identi identities, we have the identity of the first Adam. It's not ours because Jesus has redeemed us from that. And we have the identity of the last Adam. Who is our, we are called Christian because of Jesus Christ. So I, I want you to look at this. A person with dual personalities. How do they behave? Eh? They call them what? Bipolar. Without demeaning them, I want to put this in a spiritual context. You can be laughing with the person now. And the next thing, they are crying hysterically. And after crying hysterically, they are laughing again. And they are very angry. That is dual personalities. So imagine in the, the dual personality in the spiritual context. A human being saved by the blood of Jesus Christ still want to belong to the other last Adam through the sinful nature. So the person is having what? Dual personalities. That is confusion. The other personality are saying, God, I come before you as your daughter. And Satan said, eh? oh, today you are the daughter of God. Okay, so I'll give you space. But when you are done, come back. When you are done being the daughter of God, come back. I'm waiting for you. That's exactly what Pharaoh said. When Moses said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, no. They can go and worship their God. And come back. And God did not settle for that. God said, no. I want them out of Egypt. The first instance, Pharaoh was saying, no, they can worship their God in Egypt. But slavery is still waiting for them. In other ways, he wanted to, 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 to give them dual personalities. You are a slave and a worshiper. Today, we are still seeing slaves of sin and worshippers of God. And when you are a slave, you don't have rights. We, we, we're going to come to the issue of rights. When you speak about the, the legal part of redemption. Because there is a legal part of redemption. And the faith part of redemption. We, 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 we're going to come to those ones today. 
I don't want us to leave because I, I want us to live here knowing who we are. So when Pharaoh said, they cannot go, let them just go find a spot somewhere and worship. Then come back and complete. Remember, they've got a wall to complete. I'm not paying them. If they die, they'll give birth to other slaves. It doesn't matter. Dual lives. Dual spiritual lives. So I, I want us to, to look at ourselves without condemning. If you want to remove confusion, deal with your state of mind with the word of God. Who are you? Are you the redeemed of the Lord? Or are you still enslaved by sin? Otherwise, I want you to look at this, Mr. Tusi. People have celebrated Passover. Ne? In the world, everything is quiet about Passover. Resurrection Sunday. Everything is quiet. The, this whole of, from Monday, nothing was said about Passover. Today, even yesterday, I watched TV, nobody said anything about Passover. Why? To them, it was a commercial season. They are done selling. But for us, it's a continuation of redemption. We are still living under the effects of Passover. We are still proclaiming the same blood that was shed on the Passover weekend. So, who are we? Do we have dual personalities? Are we being dictated by the world how to view Christ? That, that's the question of, of, of dual pers spiritual personalities. You know, I will obey God when it suits me. Today, I, God, you'll forgive me. I'm not going to your church. You know, Sometimes as pastors, you'll blame yourself that maybe people are not coming to church because you are not teaching word. But when people who are far away from you says to you, the YouTube messages of the church keeps me going. I wish I was closer. You realize that it's not about the message. It's about the individuals. Hallelujah. We must not expect anything different in living a dual life. Let, let us go to Psalm 1. Psalm 1 verse 1. Psalms 1 verse 1. What does it say? You know the scripture. What does it say? No, but I want... I'm looking for verse 3 actually. But I think it, we must start from verse 1 to just give it context. Context, yeah. What does he say? Blessed is the man what? Who walks not in the counsel of the God, ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor is in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Whenever you see the law of the Lord, is what? The word of, of God. Hallelujah. And in his law, he... And in his law, he meditate day and night. That man spent time in the word. And check the results. Check the results. Verse 3. Verse 3. What, could take it to verse 3 quickly. What, what, what does verse 3 say? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruit in his season. Who lives shall not winter. And whatever he does shall prosper. Who's like a tree planted by the, you know, is the person who's, who's rooted in the word. Why does it look like? It's like a tree planted by the river of water. That tree doesn't say today I'm planted in the desert, today I'm in the river. The tree does not have dual personalities. So, you know, this morning again, I, I woke up and looked outside my garden. I was looking at the tree. And the Holy Spirit began to talk to me about the, about the tree. He said to me, you see this tree? said, yes. He said, this tree has been like this for millions of years. I said, how? He said, no. The tree that gave birth to the tree has never changed. It's still the same. 
Do you know why the tree is still like, like, like that? I said, no. Holy Spirit, give me a proper example. I don't understand. He said, okay, do you know why the apples, the apples still taste like apples to even to this day for millions of years? I said, I don't know. He said, because nobody was able to deceive an apple tree. An apple tree remains an apple tree for millions of years because it's still believing in what God has said. A tree. It, it, it doesn't have dual personalities. It's still an apple tree. It's not an apple mango. It's still an apple tree. For millions of years, we are still today speaking about what? Apples. But can we say the same about human beings? If you don't like this message, a little bit strong. I will say it as it is. Listen to this. I want you to be grateful today that Christ has redeemed you. You, you, you are redeemed. You are redeemed. You. The issue now is to understand your redemption. We, we, all those things that I've mentioned before, I wanted us to come to the issue of redemption. That Christ has redeemed you. We have been celebrating Passover, the crucifixion on Friday, the, the, the resurrection on Sunday. But there is life after that. And that life is because of those two days. Hallelujah. The redemption. Say, I'm the redeemed of the law. Say, I'm the redeemed of the Lord. There are two sides of redemption. Write this one down. One side is the legal side. And the other side is the vital side. The legal side has to do with what Jesus has done on the cross. That's the legal side. And the vital side has to do with us believing what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Can I, can I repeat myself? The legal side has to do with what Jesus has done on the cross. And the vital side has to do with our faith in what redemption has offered to us. So, People, because of lack of understanding of these two, of the vital side and the legal side, if you don't understand the legal side, you won't be able to apply your faith side. Do you get what I mean? Because the legal side has to do with your rights. Let us go to Romans 4.25 to, to give this context. Romans 4.25 Is it too much for one day? Eh? It's not too much, no? You still have more space on your uh, SIM cards. Why, why do you call those cards that you do for space? Eh? SD cards, no? Yeah. The next time when you come to church, you've got like a one gig. <laughs> come at least with 30, 30 gigs upwards. Amen? Because out like a one gig, you'll sleep. When your one gig is filled up, you'll do what? With a robot. So out like 30 gigs. With a robot, you I know. I want to fill up these things. You can, you can at least pay it more. Hallelujah. Romans 4.25. What, what, what does he say? Who has delivered us from our what? Our trespasses and raised us for what? For our justification. Let us, let us look at this. I said today we'll be technical, we'll be theological and all that. But I want us to look at this. Delivered. 
Okay, let us go to second, first Corinthians, no, first Peter. So first Peter 1, 8 to, 1, 18 to 19. Be, before, don't go there, I'll, 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 I'll read it for you. First Peter 1, first Peter chapter 1. Okay, let me put, let me put it the language that will say. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your what? Check from your what? Fathers. But with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. So we were redeemed by the what? Say by the blood of Jesus Christ. So I want us to first understand what is the meaning of the word redeem or redemption? Redemption means to be bought back. Amen? You are what? Bought back. Bought back from whom? In America, in the time of slavery, there were those nice uh, people who will, who will buy the slaves in order to set them free. You know that, you know, you know that, ne? They will buy the slaves in order to do what? To set them free. So, but what were we slaves for? Let us go to Genesis 2. No, don't go there. I'll, I'll go there on your behalf. Just write it down. Genesis 2, 17. God said to man, there is a tree in the midst of a garden. If you eat that tree, you will surely what? Die. And when that, when men ate the tree, what, they became slaves of what? Sin. And who was the owner of sin? Satan. Men became the slaves to who? Satan. But there is another definition of sin. What is sin? To being separated from God. Is what is sin. Or sin, the other definition is, is without God. Is what? sin. Are we together? So men became slaves to what? To sin. Like somebody being slaves to what? To daha. Somebody being slaves to what? To drugs. To cocaine. Heroin. Those are the results of what? Being separated from God. Because okay, let me tell you why people take drugs. People take drugs in order to to close the void that was left by men when men get separated with God. Yes. The drunkenness or the highness when they are high, they are trying to close the gap. That, that emptiness that they have, where God is supposed to be, they use drugs. That's the reason why you don't understand why people get drunk. Do you know why? Because you, are, you have what they are looking for when they get drunk. You have what they are looking for when they take drugs. You have what they are looking for when they take uh, all those things. Why? Because sin has separated them, has left a void from the master. So when God came, he said, man, you can always be slave of sin. That's the reason why Egypt is a perfect example when God said the children of Israel would spend 400 years in Egypt under slavery, he, was, he wanted to show us what redemption does to a man. Why 400 years? There has to be generation after generation who will know nothing else but what? Slavery. Are we together? Hallelujah. You shall know the truth. Say, say, neighbor, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. So, let us look at this now. Let us look at this. Man was under the chains of what? Sin. Everything that he did was what? Sinful. He was what? Say suffering. Enslaved by sin. But this redemption has to take three things. That's the one thing that you must understand. 
God, when God, God did not give the world to men. Uh, this, I, th th there is a gospel, there is a narrative that is going on that. God did not give the world to men. He gave the rulership of the world to men. That's why Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and its fullness, and they that dwell therein. So that's the authority that God did not give to men. So when man has to redeemed, have to be redeemed from sin, he has to be redeemed first from what? From that which he willingly surrendered to Satan. The authority that God has over man was willingly surrendered to Satan. When Satan has authority over you, you do what he wants. He becomes the Lord of your life. I gave this example that there was a man drinking in one of the township. The man was so drunk, I was attending a wedding. He was so drunk, he couldn't stand. He took his coat. He stumbled and found a tree. No, not a pole. A, a, a pole. He held a electric pole like this. He took his coat. He drank it. He finished it. By the time the coat got finished, he was on the floor. Finished. In my mind, I'm saying, if that man knows how much damage he's causing to himself, he won't do that. Do you know why he was, he was drinking like that, even though he was still drunk? Because he's a slave. He's a slave to what? To alcohol, to whatever that is driving him. So, being a slave of sin, you don't know when you are hating yourself. You don't know when you are making yourself sick. You don't know when you are making yourself broke. You don't know when you are making yourself poor. Why? Because you have become a slave of all those things. And they become attractive to you. Like, for example, a person who takes the gun and go to, to rob a cash, a, a cash in transit, the chances of, of that person dying are high. But because, because they become a slave of crime, they don't know how to stop themselves because that, they believe that that's the only way to live. So if you understand that when you are redeemed, God is saying, Satan, you got these people legally because they broke the law, the word. And I said in my word, if they touch this, they will surely die. And their death was separation from me. Now I want them back. They can no longer be enslaved by you. Yes, they lost their will. Don't be up. It's my 12 o'clock alarm for prayer. Don't be, don't fight back. Satan said, but they're, they're, they're my people. And God said, it's okay. They're your people. But I know what I said. I, I said, whoever eat this food will surely die. But now, death is going to come. Not from man, but from me, God, in the form of the Son. Are we clear? So, I'm going to die. I said the word that if they eat the fruit, they will die. But I will die on their behalf. Why, why am I dying? Because you, Satan, you are right. Within your right... You have every right to hold unto men, to enslave them to sin, because they've transgressed my word, and my word is law. Are we together? Hallelujah. So, God came, he died. That's the reason why Romans 4.25 says, we were delivered up from our trust and raised to our justification. Why? Who delivered us? God himself. So if you understand that, that will give you the ability to resist enslavement. Because enslavement comes in the form of what? Attraction. It's attractive. It attracts what? First, your appetite. It can be your actual physical appetite of food or your desires of the flesh, or the desires of your pride. When those three are, at, are attractive to you, you are, 
Satan is able to use them to entrap you. When he entraps you, he is legally authorized to be the Lord of your life. And guess what Satan specializes in death? When that You must look at your areas of your life where there is no life. Where there is no life in any area of your life, check if ever you have been given authority to Satan. I'm, now I'm talking about the vital side of redemption. How would you know if you don't believe in what God has said concerning that area? Your faith has now affected the legality of your redemption in your life. For example, one man once asked Pastor Reynard Bonke, said to him, you said the blood of Jesus Christ is powerful. It redeems, it saves. Why do we still have so many sinners in the world? And Pastor Reynard Bonke answered and said, there is a lot of soap in the world. Why do we still have dirty people in the world? Which is true. In other words, the redemptive power of the blood of Jesus Christ is more effective when you believe in it. That's where your faith comes in. Are we together? Can we stand up a bit? I still have 30 minutes with you. No, yeah, 20 minutes with you. Stand up a bit. Stand up. But this one you must know. This one you must know. I'm not going to allow you to go home without understanding this. Galatians 3.13 Say, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone that hangs on a tree. Why? The curse and the law. According to the law, anybody who does not believe in Christ is still living under what? A curse. Say, I believe in Christ. I've got the legal right to obtain and get, receive everything that comes with salvation. Say, that is healing, that is provision, that is peace, that is health, that is everything that encompasses life. I have received that. They are legally mine. I believe it, and that settles it. Are we together? So, let your spirit man... Repeat that again and again. Ask yourself this question. Why somebody, one of the politicians said this, that the law is for the rich. The poor go in jail even though, although they are not supposed to because they can't afford legal representatives. So I want, to put, I want to put it to you this way, in the spiritual context. Salvation is for those who understand their redemption rights in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Go and find out more about that. Go and search more about that. That, okay, I'm not perfect. But who am I in this salvation theme? Where do I fit in? Okay. Since I was born, if you want to check the effects of salvation in your family, I, 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 I want you to do this homework. Since you were born again, is there progress in your family? Compare it to your fathers who brought in salvation. Where were they? Okay, they were driving bicycles. 
The next generation believed God. They are driving Corollas. The next generation believed God. They are driving Mercedes. The next generation believed God. They are driving Rolls Royce. There should be that progression. Are we together? Hallelujah. Are we together? Hallelujah. I want you to go and check that progression. Where am I? If, if I'm living this life now, what type of life will my children live? And that progression, do you want to understand it? Go and read the Bible. From the children of Israel when they were in Egypt until they reached the promised land. What were the effects of sin in the promised land? How were they captured by the, by the foreign kings when they sinned against God? And how were they restored back to their kingdom, to their, to their country, when they repented and they began to prosper again? You will understand what redemption does in the life of a Christian. Hallelujah. Is it too deep for you? A little bit. Hmm? Do you know why many people are discouraged in Christianity? Do you know why? Because they are not getting what they were promised when they were born again. That's not true. Not Why? Because many get discouraged because they are not seeing all those redemptive rights. I'll stop here today because I can see you can it. But I want to continue. Hey, Kwezi, I don't know. Don't stop. Okay, Kwezi, I'm listening to you. <laughs> Kwezi, I don't know, Pastor. Don't. Don't stop. Okay. You may be seated just for 10 minutes where we are going. We are going. Say I'm the product. I say I'm the product of the redemption through the blood of Jesus. Say where I am, I have everything I need. No, say like you say where I am, I have everything I need. Say my God has supplied. All my needs according to his riches in glory in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Yeah, I'm, I'm told to stop. I know some of you are saying, Pastor, continue. But I'm just going to give you a homework. Let us take these scriptures down. Hebrews 9. 11 to 12. Colossians 1, 14. Or oh, go and read the whole book of Colossians actually. The, okay. Re, let, let me put this way. Galatians chapter 1 is the chapter of redemption. Read it. The book of Colossians it talks about redemption. The whole book of Colossians, read it. Because next week I want us to touch on the, on the vital side of redemption. That talks about our faith, how we conduct ourselves. How do you believe the word? Because it's easy for me to tell you believe the word, but how do you believe it? Name is the Yeah, How do you believe the word? What makes you believe the word? Can I give you one example? What makes you believe the constitution of South Africa? Because you are the citizen of South Africa. And when someone says to you, you don't, you don't do this, you will say, I've got the rights. South Africa, I know democracy brought forth, brought forth the rights and less responsibilities. I didn't say the last word, but it just came out of my mouth, but I didn't say it. It gave people more what, rights than what? Responsibilities. So how do you know redemption? How do you, how do you, know, how do you believe the word? 
you can you will never have the ability to believe the word until you understand your position so this two the legal side of redemption gives you the ability to understand your position in Christ that okay i'm in Christ the fact that you are in Christ that didn't necessarily mean that the enemy will stop trying to deceive you no he will continue Hallelujah. So what do you do when he does that? Go for the word. Go for the word. When he, when he went to Jesus Christ, tempt him, Jesus Christ didn't go and say, do you know who I am? Do you know who my pastor is? Do you know where I'm coming from? Satan, by this sticker, go away. <laughs> no. Jesus said, it is written. Do you know why he said it is written? Because he aligned, associated himself with the word, because he was the word. When the moment he said it is written, Satan was left powerless. He could not do anything. Why? Because he knows that this person knows his story. I love the sons of Sceva. You are tired of hearing that, but I will say it. People who don't have a relationship with the word versus people who have the relationship with the word. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, go away. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who are you? But check the word. The Bible said when Jesus Christ, immediately when he got off the ship, when he approaches the graves, there was a madman of Gadara. Before Jesus can utter anything, the men begin to say, why you, sir? I know you are Jesus, the son of man. Why have you come to torment me before time? Jesus Christ did not say to the demon, go out. You know, you have that relationship with the word such that when you enter a place, demons flee before you can open your mouth. Because you understand who you are. You, you know your legal standing in redemption. You know, Satan is more aware of your conscience than you. What you say, what you say with your mouth, if it's not coming from your heart, is ineffective. That's what happened to the sons of Sceva. They were saying things that they heard, but it was not from their heart. They were not convicted by the word. Whereas Paul was convicted by the word. He was right inside the word. For in him he lives, moves, and has his being. In what? In the word. So the moment you are in the word, you become the word. You, there are certain things you don't have to pray for. If they are contrary to the word, listen to this. Jesus Christ did not pray that he must not get sick. Show me a verse. Where Jesus Christ was praying that he must not get sick. No, he did not pray for that for himself. He did not pray that he must not be poor. He did not pray such prayers. He did not pray. Even when he come to death, he said, I've got the power to lay down my life and pick it up again. Why? Anything that was contrary to what the word of God has said concerning was not possible to manifest. Why? Because he knew he was. So guess, the person in Jesus, who redeemed us, knew who he was, and he gave us the same rights. Do, do you understand? He gave you what? The same right. Legally now, you are Jesus. No, you don't understand. Do you, you want me to continue? Let me continue. Legally, you are Jesus. When you speak, you are Jesus. When you sing, you are Jesus. Why? Let let, 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 let us go to the scripture. I just want you to, to see something. Galatians 4, 4, 7. He said, But when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, praying our father. Therefore, you are no more servant but a son, then an heir of God through Christ Jesus. 
That's who you are. You are a joint heir with Christ. We are heirs of the Father. You are, do, you know that? do you know what I mean? You are a joint heir with Christ. When you, when you live here, do, do not look at, at precious. No. Sometimes you must look at him and say, Jesus, I was a woman with him, man. Looking at your face, he said, no, I'm not me. So God, I appreciate you. Look at you. It is biblical. And God said, let us make men according to our image. Only he can hear the child crying. Do you know why? She's the mother. I want to put it to you something. Only God can hear your voice because he's your father. Hallelujah. Can we stand up? Can we stand up? No. You are standing up now because you are going to make few confessions. Say, Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Say, he has been made a curse for me so that I can be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Say, in Christ, through his blood, I have found 